Okay, in the lecture that y'all watched on Friday, you saw uh, that, okay, the beginnings of the Chesapeake Colony. So uh, if you watch that video, uh, we talked about some of these things. Uh, the Chesapeake region is a little bit different. Okay? It's the first area that they had colonized. So Jamestown is our first colony with settlement. And uh, out of that, of course, has grown the Virginia Colony. And uh, it is uh, one of the first to be established. And so I covered that. And I also went in, which is uh, right next door and very similar, right? Because they are both agricultural. They're both tobacco producing, okay? They are part of a bigger group, okay? And I have stuff that up here. They are part of uh, really what most historians and most textbooks break down as the Southern Colony, okay? All of those colonies share a couple of things uh, in common, okay? So if you look at the Southern Colonies as a whole, okay, in general, they all have uh, some things that are pretty similar. They're very rural, they're spread out, they're very agricultural. Okay? Each of them will find something really that becomes an agricultural product that they can send back. Okay? Some of them will be tobacco, some of them will be like South Carolina rice and indigo. Okay? Cotton does not come into the picture yet. When we say uh, Southern colonies uh, okay, in the South, most of you immediately leap to uh, the thought about King Cotton and Cotton being uh, the South's only export. Okay? That hasn't happened yet. Okay? Cotton is not a very uh, economical product in uh, the late 1600s, okay, early 1700s. It's very difficult to work with. Okay, cotton won't become uh, a little bit easier to produce until you get a little bit later on after the invention of the cotton mill. Okay? So uh, that's a big uh, change. In the beginning, though, uh, it's all about tobacco, Virginia, Maryland, uh, Delaware to some extent, North Carolina are all tobacco producing uh, areas, okay? major tobacco producing areas. For those of you uh, that are sports minded, for example, what's the, uh, and it's not a very, it's not very far, but what's the road that connects the University of North Carolina and Duke College? Do they know? Tobacco Road. What did the Duke family who created Duke University, where did they make their money off of? Tobacco. Okay. So, North Carolina has this long history with the tobacco because especially in the northern part of North Carolina, it is very similar to Virginia. Okay? So these areas are tobacco producing areas in the beginning, but later they're going to have to evolve because tobacco isn't necessarily the most profitable crop that they can uh, come up with. Okay? And uh, they will eventually begin to make that shift towards cotton later on. They, uh, because they are so spread out, okay, because they're so rural, because they're so agricultural, they uh, oftentimes uh, are not as well educated as uh, some of the areas that we're going to see later on. Very difficult if you live uh, 20 miles from your nearest neighbor to think about how you're going to school your kids, right? What are you going to do? Put them on a horse and let them ride, uh, you know, 30 miles to. Uh, the school, so there's a, it's the, the size of these uh, and the spread out, the, uh, the, the ruralness of the southern colonies is going to be a hindrance later on to some of the things that they're going to do. But also you need to know that Virginia is going to become uh, pretty quickly one of the world, or one of the world, one of the nation, well, it's not even a nation yet, one of the, one of North America's greatest, biggest English colonies, and eventually one of the most populous, okay? There'll be more people uh, in Virginia simply because of its size. So uh, then you'll compare that to some places like Georgia that are not particularly, uh, don't have that particularly many people. So now today, for you guys, we're gonna shift up here to New England, okay? And uh, to understand New England, uh, you have to understand what's eventually going to become Massachusetts. 
Okay. Massachusetts is the heart of everything. Okay. These colonies that we classify as the New England colonies, okay, eventually the first two are uh, the, uh, the Plymouth Colony and then later the Massachusetts Bay Colony. They will eventually come together to form what becomes Massachusetts. So uh, Plymouth and uh, the Bay Colony will combine to become Massachusetts. But the other three, Connecticut, Rhode Island, uh, and New Hampshire, are all offshoots of Massachusetts, okay? Breakaways even, if you want to think of it that way, Rhode Island is, okay? So Massachusetts really is a heart of uh, what is considered to be the New England colonies. Now, let's take them as a whole for a second, okay? Talk about some of their characteristics, okay? Number one, they are very different from the South, okay? Land up here will not support widespread, uh, profitable agriculture, okay? It goes back to the Ice Age. A lot of this area in the north was glaciated. Okay, glaciers moved down, uh, stripped away a lot of the topsoil. They okay, left this area very rocky, okay? So uh, there, this area is never going to be a major agricultural area. It just simply can't sustain large-scale agriculture. So for them, I want you to think about that, okay? Here in the South, there is a need uh, for agricultural labor. And I talked about that in the last week. Changing how the New England did it to try to satisfy that labor requirement by what? First, it was for a purpose. And this is purpose. Remember, you uh, summarized the sentence here. It came to be a sentence of the work for a Okay. And that's how they survived the poor people from England over the centuries. For a period of time, even in the last century. But in 1619, uh, Africans arrived. All right, I told you in the beginning, we don't exactly know what they were. This is still a pretty hotly debated topic among historians what those Africans that arrived uh, in Virginia really were. They weren't necessarily slaves because what we envisage as slavery doesn't exist yet, okay? The, uh, the, 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 the laws, the, uh, the infrastructure really of uh, what a lot of us think about as, uh, as slavery in the American South doesn't exist yet, okay? So they aren't technically slaves, okay? They aren't technically indentured servants, okay? And so uh, what really are they? But that infrastructure, that apparatus of slavery is eventually going to grow. And I talked a little bit about slave codes and stuff, if you watch that, where that does begin to happen. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later on when we kind of dig down in the nuts and bolts of uh, colonial slavery. But in New England, there's no need for it. Okay, now they need labor for several things, but they don't need it for agriculture because what did I tell you? They just, they don't have a need for it, okay? New England, uh, as a result, is going to change, really, the, the pattern of settlement in New England is gonna be very, very different, okay? They will settle close together in towns, they're much more urban, okay? So you have people clustered together in towns okay, rather than being very rural and spread out. Land ownership doesn't really matter all that much. Why? Because you can't really grow anything, okay? In the South, land ownership is the gateway to uh, participation in politics. Remember me telling you, I mentioned this when we talked about in that lecture about Bacon's Rebellion, that a lot of those former uh, indentured servants who don't have any land, they also can't participate in the government, okay? That won't be uh, the requirement in New England. What gets you participation in government in New England is much different 
Okay. So uh, they have to be prepared to, uh, to adjust, and they do. When you don't have uh, land that will support big scale agriculture, they do things different. So they live close together. They settle in towns. They uh, will uh, still produce food, but not on a grand scale. Their education is better, okay? They'll produce schools, okay? To be honest, their climate is better. Their life expectancy is better, okay? Living in towns gave them uh, really an advantage over those people in the South, okay? I think about it. In the South, you fall down, you break your leg, and you're 20 miles from anyone else that can give you help. Okay, in uh, New England, living in a town, you're walking down the street and you fall down and you break your leg, you're 20 meters from anybody that can come and help you, okay? It's not a big deal. There's a totally different scheme, uh, really scheme here. So this is what we're talking about, okay? We focus on Massachusetts first. To understand this, okay, this is where you really gotta dig down deep, okay? Because, uh, the pattern here is much different. The people that come here are much different. Okay. What was Jamestown founded for? The Virginia Company founded Jamestown, sent people over here for what? To make a profit. Okay. To make a profit. Jamestown is uh, a... Uh, joint stock colony in the beginning. That company, just like any company today that you buy stock in, Apple, uh, Microsoft, whatever, what's that company's goal? To make a profit, okay? New England uh, is totally different, okay? The groups that settle New England come here for one thing uh, and one thing only in the beginning. What is it? Religious freedom. Okay. These are totally different people. They're coming here because they are motivated to come here because the situation in England is, and in Europe, is uh, to the point where they feel like they have to leave and come to America to try to make a fresh start. And religion and freedom of religion is what motivates them. Okay. All right. To start, we have to uh, kind of go back. And I got to do a little bit of uh, explaining here, okay, about the difference between uh, these two groups, okay? It is essential to understand the Constitution, to understand the difference between these two groups, the separatists and the Puritans. Okay. These two groups began inside of uh, the Church of England. Okay. They are Protestants. Okay. So these are not Catholic refugees like that settled Maryland. Okay. These are Protestants. But inside of uh, the Church of England. Okay inside of the Church of England. There are groups that are not necessarily satisfied with the things that are going on inside of the Church of England. All right, this happens in every church, right? Okay, if you have, uh, if you are a regular church attender, you know that there are cliques and there are uh, groups, all right? That always happens. That's, I mean, it's no different than when you were in high school, right? People segregate themselves out into these different groups, right? So uh, the same thing is happening inside the Church of England. There are groups that are perfectly fine with the way the Church of England is being run, okay? But there are other groups that have some issues. And the Separatists and the Puritans uh, are two such groups that are questioning uh, how the Church of England uh, is uh, developing, okay? And what's going on, okay? We'll take a look at the Puritans first, okay? 
then I'll come back to the separatists, okay? But the Puritans uh, are uh, influenced pretty heavily by John Calvin. And I told you guys a little bit about Calvin earlier on. Calvin is uh, one of the leaders of the Protestant Reformation. He comes along a little bit after Martin Luther. He is extremely active in France and in what is today uh, Switzerland. Calvin's most famous work is called The Institutes on the Christian Religion. Okay? And in it, he talks about things like predestination. And I told you guys, we kind of talked a little bit about what predestination was. God is omniscient. God is omnipotent. God knows before you were ever born, uh, if you will what? If you will uh, make it to heaven, if you will receive the gift of salvation. Okay? And we talked about why that is troubling. It's because it takes away uh, your concept of free will. Now, wait a minute. I should have the choice, right? But if God is omniscient and God is omnipotent, God already knows. Okay? How do you know? You don't. So you better live uh, like you uh, do have the gift of salvation. Okay, show yourself approved by God. Now Puritans uh, also, and they get their name, by the way, okay? They get their name uh, because uh, they want to uh, purify the Church of England. So they're But the most important thing is they want to eliminate all traces of Catholicism. In order for the Church of England to truly move forward, they believe that every trace of Catholicism needed to be removed from the Church of England. Now remember, guys, the Church of England... Uh, if I zapped you back to uh, a year or two after Henry takes the, uh, the English church out of the Catholic church, and you guys went to a Church of England service, it's going to resemble uh, a Catholic service. Okay? And that shouldn't surprise you. It's what they're comfortable with. It's what they know. Okay? And so over time, they have developed more and more of the Protestant sort of uh, way of worshiping. But the Puritans don't think they've gone far enough. And so they even get their name because they want to make changes to uh, the Catholic Church. Okay? Or excuse me, to the Church of England, I'm sorry. Because they want to remove all traces of uh, Catholicism. The Puritans began as a pretty small group, like all reform groups do, okay? And one of the things that tends to happen, if you start, you know, if you start, you know, grouping and, and grousing about some of the things that are going on inside of the church, you make enemies. The leaders of the church of England don't like these guys pointing out all the things that are wrong with the way they're running the church. And so it should not shock you all that they start getting discriminated against. Leaders of the Church of England won't let them uh, have uh, high church offices. They uh, are kind of shunned. Okay? They're pushed to the side. And they're viewed really as a bunch of, uh, you know, sort of fringe, uh, kind of crazies, if you will. And look, the Puritans brought a lot of this on themselves. Okay, they were very conservative. Okay, they didn't like certain things. Uh, they believed that they were, uh, they were wrong, and they pointed them out. And so as they get discriminated against more and more inside of their own church, and then all of a sudden, chances at colonization in the New World start to open up. And so what are some of them going to do? I can stay here and be discriminated against by my own church, or I can take a chance over there and have uh, religious freedom. We can set up our own church. 
and some of them are going to take that route. The Puritans, uh, the first groups of Puritans that are going to come over here, they are going to establish the Bank Army. The Massachusetts Bank Army is where they are going to settle. Okay. So it is Puritans uh, that will uh, establish the Massachusetts Bay. All right. Puritans are different than these guys, okay? Separatists. Look at their name. If we're calling a group separatists, then what do you think they want to do? I mean, it, it's not rocket science, right? They want to do what? Separate from what? Okay. All right. The separatists believe that the Church of England has become so corrupt that it is beyond faith. Okay. That the Church of England is so corrupt that it is... Uh, almost polluting their religious beliefs. Think of it like this, okay? If you got a massive infection in one of your limbs, your leg or your arm, okay, to save the rest of your body, what do sometimes doctors feel like they're forced to do? Yes, remove that limb, okay? whether it be your arm or your leg. <coughs> Excuse me. So what do you think the separatists believe? If the church has become so corrupt, what do they have to do? Remove themselves from it. So the separatists have actually gone so far as to break away from the Church of England, okay? So, they really kind of started off as Puritans, okay? But because the Church of England let in all of these people, they believed that they had to go to church with people who weren't necessarily saved, and their corruption was bad. It influenced their children. It influenced their way of life, and they felt like the only thing that they could do was to break away from the Church of England. The separatists believed that, like Calvin, okay, that you don't necessarily know whether or not you have the gift of salvation. Okay. So you may not know, but there might be signs. The Puritans call them visible saints. There might be signs that things were going great in your life. Your business was doing well. Your household was doing well. You all were healthy. Okay. And so... Uh, if those signs, you may have had a religious experience, okay? What the separatists wanted uh, was to be able to control uh, who they went to church with. That's pretty much the uh, their, their gripe, okay? And for them to accept you, you had to go before them uh, and demonstrate that you had had this religious experience, that you were worthy of joining uh, their ranks. Now, the Puritans will do this too. Okay? The Puritans will eventually sort of break into this idea as well and start using it as well. well what it began to do is control church membership. Okay? And you had to prove your worth to the rest of the church body that you were worth membership. Eventually, in New England, it's going to be called the New England Way, okay, where you had to go before your peers, you had to go before uh, your fellow church members, confess your sins, uh, talk about your weaknesses, 
talk about your religious experience, okay? And then they determine whether or not you were worthy of joining their ranks. Now look, anybody want to volunteer and go do that? Okay, I mean, if you're taking a speech class, okay? Anybody want to go for their speech class and talk about all your sins and your transgressions and all the things that you've done wrong? Then talk about your religious experience and your relationship with God. That's very personal stuff. And it's hard. So why would people be willing to do that? Because church membership in New England is what's going to get you political uh, involvement. You have to be a church member after the New England colonies are settled in order to vote, in order to participate. Okay, What was it here? Land. What is it there? Church membership. That tells you all you need to know. They're very different from one another. Okay? The separatists are going to be the ones that will settle Plymouth. Okay? The separatists will settle their own colony at Plymouth. And they try to remain pretty separate from uh, the rest of Massachusetts. They do so for a while. The people that settle the Plymouth Colony, you aren't accustomed to calling them separatists. Okay? When you were four or five or six in uh, your little Thanksgiving uh, right, parades and when you got to do hand turkeys and dress up like all right, Native Americans or what? Pilgrims. The separatists are the pilgrims. Okay, and they are the first to arrive. And you guys probably, I hope, remember a little bit of the story. Okay, the separatists, because they were so discriminated against, because they had left the church, some of them had actually had to leave England already, had gone to the Netherlands, had gone to other places, where they became concerned that their way of life was dwind was really dwindling. Their children started to learn Dutch because you're hanging around with Dutch kids, and so they start to uh, learn the language, and they, they lose their English identity the longer they stay there. And so some of these pilgrims, separatists, decide to try to come to the New World. Okay? And uh, in 1620, a group of... Uh, about a hundred, okay, a little over a hundred will make the journey uh, to uh, what becomes Plymouth. Now, not all of them that made the voyage here on the Mayflower were separatists. The pilgrims were a pretty smart lot, and they realized that they might need some help, that not all of them were good. Uh, at certain things, okay? Does that make sense? So, uh, a little over 50 of them are separatists, and then they hire people to come along with them to uh, help them, okay? They will negotiate with the Virginia company, and the negotiation was is that they would settle inside the Virginia company's boundaries. So they are technically supposed to be coming over here, settling near Virginia, and of course then trying to find something to, to make a profit. Okay. You want to talk about another debate? Did the pilgrims ever intend to do that? And a lot of people say no, that the pilgrims had no intention of really honoring uh, this bargain. Okay. That when they got here, they were going to settle on their own. Now, some people say they got here and got lost, lost, and they uh, settled uh, wherever they could, okay? Others believe that they fully intended to settle uh, outside of uh, the boundaries, okay? Great example of somebody they brought with them that's not necessarily a, uh, a pilgrim is Miles Standish. Miles Standish is a military guy, okay? They felt like they needed somebody to... Uh, help them uh, survive, okay, give them some military uh, advice, okay, so they bring guys like Miles Standish with them, okay, so they will settle in Plymouth Bay, okay, 
and uh, that is, of course, outside of uh, the Virginia company's domain. And essentially, they settle here and squat, okay, because they're not where they're supposed to be. Now, one of the things they do, and this is really interesting, okay, one of the things that they do before they ever get off the boat, okay, is uh, they write this up and sign it. We call it the Mayflower Compact, okay? All right, a couple things here, okay? Number one, it's not technically a constitution. It's not necessarily technically a, uh, a contract or a frame of government. It's really an agreement, okay? It's compact means agreement. But if you look right here, it kind of tells you what they're after, okay? Excuse me. Okay, I gotta get my eyes to adjust here. Okay, so, and by virtue uh, to enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, uh, acts, constitutions, and offices from time to time as shall be thought most needed and convenient for the general good of the colony. Okay. So they agree, and they all sign, all the separatists sign it, all the pilgrims sign it, that basically what they will do is, uh, as a body, they will uh, enact laws, ordinances, do what they need to do for the best of the colony. Is that technically a frame of government? Well, maybe, okay? But they are essentially, if you kind of, figure it out here. They're essentially, do they have any oversight? They're outside of the Virginia company's boundaries, right? So they're really framing their own government here if you kind of want to push that a little bit. Okay. And they sign it, but it's essentially an agreement, like I told you, to form a crude government and uh, submit to majority rule if they had to, okay? So uh, 41 adult males sign it, okay? And essentially it led to the pilgrims creating an assembly type of government. They needed to make a decision, they all came together and they voted, okay? That's pretty cool, okay? That's interesting, okay? We'll talk about kind of these uh, these things that start making the Americans a little bit different when we get to the American Revolution. And they're, ever since the beginning, in some ways, used to governing themselves. Okay, they're an ocean away from Mama England. Okay, and they've had to govern, they've gotten good at it too. They've had to govern themselves. Okay, all right. They settle at Plymouth Plantation, which kind of looked like that, okay. They do eventually, uh, all right, agree uh, to uh, kind of settle here that this is the place. But when do they get off the boat? Well, I'll tell you, when do they get off the boat? November 1620, right? What's it like in New England in November? It's starting to get cold, okay? So if they don't get off the boat until November, how much food do they have? How many, could they plant any crops? Could they, all right? So they're in trouble, okay? Only 44 out of the original 102 survive, okay? But when the Mayflower decided to leave and go back to England early in 1621, how many of them left to go back to England? No. Okay? So they're here to stay, okay? One of the things that they will learn to do and learn to do quickly is uh, how to farm. And the best thing for it is all the way around the world. Okay, being from an English country who was actually being claimed by other Native Americans in the region. They meet with the pilgrims and say, hey, will you help us? And in exchange, we'll help you. And the pilgrims need some buddies, and they're like, woohoo, okay. 
And so what they help the, uh, really the Native American groups okay, that they are allied with, they help them because what did the pilgrims have that the Native Americans didn't have? Firearms, guns, okay? And so they use that technological advantage to uh, help these groups kind of break away from uh, the other Native American groups that were causing them. And you guys know what happens next. Native Americans like Squanto help the pilgrims, teach them how to raise crops in the soil, which remember is sandy and rocky. Okay? So they teach them how to raise crops. And by the fall of 1621, you have the first Thanksgiving, okay, where they share the bounty with uh, their allies. Okay, great story. Okay, we don't. And what you should never do, though, and we kind of, I think the the story of the first Thanksgiving kind of ruins it for us, is that we think from there on out that the pilgrims are a bunch of foreigners, okay, and they're not. They fall out of but they start to do other things, okay? They start to trade in furs, lumber, okay, shipping, okay, fishing, anything that they can make a living at, <coughs> excuse me, they start, they start to explore. They're not okay? Not the And it turns is never going to be uh, tremendously big, okay? In 1691, it only has, and that's a stretch, it only has 7,000 people, okay, living in Plymouth. So it's not terribly big, and it's not very economically important. And so uh, they will eventually, uh, by the end of the 1600s, merge with the bay and when the plymouth and the bay merge that's when you get massachusetts okay all right remember okay that the pilgrims that settle plymouth are not puritans they are separatists they are very different from the group that is going to come uh, and we're going to talk about here in a second that goes and really does the bay colony they are religiously very different. If you want to learn about what the pilgrims were like, okay, you can go and read William Bradford. Okay? He was uh, a scholar, self-taught. He served as governor of Plymouth 30 times in yearly elections. Okay? He writes of Plymouth Plantation. And so uh, if you want to learn what life was like for uh, the pilgrims that settled here, you can go and read Bradford's account and you get a very clear picture of uh, what life was like for them. Okay, Great primary source. But remember, nagging at the Puritans was always this. It's what had led them to separate from the church and it's what had kept them separate from the Bay Colony that other people would corrupt them, okay, and corrupt their society. And so that's why they had remained separate, there's that word again, for so long. All right. Plymouth is right here. Okay, the first settlement is right there, okay. And so this little area, kind of right down here, is what was considered to be Plymouth, okay? Now, further up north here, everything from up here is gonna be the Bay Colony, okay? That really is part of and connected to, oddly enough, the Massachusetts Bay, okay? And so, uh, the Bay Colony, you remember, is a little bit different, okay? Well, it's not quite, okay? Almost a decade after the pilgrims arrive, the first real uh, boatloads of uh, Puritans are going to begin to make 
plans to come here to America, okay? And really about a decade after the Mayflower, a thousand or so people uh, will make the journey to the Massachusetts Bay. Boston River becomes the of the Bay Colony, but there are other settlements that began to spring up as well. Okay. So in the 1630s, there is a great migration of Puritans. Okay. This is about a decade before the English Civil War breaks out. There's political term, really political turmoil. There's religious turmoil. There's all sorts of crazy things happening. The Puritans are being discriminated against. And so this leads to the first migration. They'll pick up their stakes from England and come here to America seeking religious freedom. Okay. Not all of them were Puritans, but most of them were. So uh, during that time, okay, you're talking about 70,000 or so Puritans that will leave coming to America, maybe 20, 25,000 more that aren't necessarily Puritans that will come to America. You're talking about 100,000 people that will uh, start to make their migration to America in uh, the 1630s. Okay? Now, Puritans, remember, are going to be the Bay Colony. Okay, and uh, they are a little bit different. Okay, all right, we'll stop there. Okay, and uh, we'll pick up here. So, when you guys watch the lecture on uh, Wednesday, we'll pick up and finish up the Bay Colony. We'll talk about the offshoots of Massachusetts, and we'll probably move a little bit into the middle colonies. Okay, all right, next week, remember, we won't be here on Monday. Okay, so. Uh, we got a choice, okay? I'm all uh, in favor.